Welcome to episode 430 of the Barcelona Podcast, brought to you by the Blue Wire Podcast Network. I'm Dean Hilton, and he's Emil Evanesian. And Emil, we've got quite a bit of work to do today, believe it or not. We've got the good, we've got the bad, and we've got the ugly, of course. Are you ready? Uh, yes. There's Yeah, there really is a lot flying at us. Yeah, so I, I think where we start, instead of the good or the bad, we actually start with the ugly. And I think that is yesterday's first team result, the one nothing yes. win over Hadafe. And I immediately started my five headlines, not to retread some of mm-hmm. that for those who listen to both, but I think some of this will be retreaded. I did a bunch of tactics talk there yesterday that I'd like to uh, extrapolate mm-hmm. on today. But I do look at the big picture thing. And again, the continued complaint, which is a fair complaint this season, that Barcelona and Real Madrid would do the same thing if it was them in the first place position. Both of those teams, the two big giants, are ahead of the pack, sure, with Real Sociedad doing really well in third place. But both of the two big regular giants are slogging their way through results, whether it was Barcelona yeah. yesterday or it was Madrid yesterday uh, against against Villarreal. So no, so either, or not Villarreal, sorry, Athletic Club. So either yeah. way, both of the giants are bad results. And usually we get used to that with Real Madrid. They get bad results and yet they still, or they get, they get bad performances, good results, and it works out for them. But Then in the end, they win the Champions League. Exactly. And they win the Champions mm-hmm. League. But for mm-hmm. Barcelona, Kules expect a higher standard of that because, mm-hmm. as is the case many times, if Barcelona are not playing well on the field and showcasing what they're able to do at the highest level, then yep. the trophies don't seem to follow, right? Like Barcelona need yeah. to be playing their best football to win trophies. And that is something I think that is ingrained in the belief of Kules, which is a fair thing to do. But yep. I do want to kind of reset some of the optimism there about yesterday. And I know that when it comes to such of the Champions League and Araujo not being there, that excuses like that don't work because you have a full squad. But yesterday's rotation was such that, and I want to get into the tactics of yesterday's rotation and why mm-hmm. I think the omissions or those unavailable yesterday made yesterday's performance so poor. So in particular, as I kind of said, in January so far, Barca have had mm-hmm. six points from six in the Liga with Lewandowski suspended for both games. They yep. played their best football against Real Madrid in a final to win a trophy and they were able to rotate the squad yesterday with Araujo and De Jong out. And even Gabi got a half a rest midweek yep. uh, last week. But Araujo and De Jong held out against Adafe for Real Sociedad on Wednesday. So, I, again, I do fear, I, I do understand the fears that Barcelona are going back to their old habits of failing to break down a five at the back. Um, mm-hmm. But I do think that, again, the lineup would have been much different if, if everybody was available. Not only that, but if if this game truly quote unquote mattered. Yeah, if this was a must win game, that would that's not the lineup I think we would have seen. No, Araujo for Roberto would mm-hmm. have been instant, guaranteed, a hundred percent. Not I'm not saying he was playing right back, but it would have been Kunde playing right back and yep. Roberto would have been on the bench. Like if this game truly mattered and with that change, that one little change, your defensive transition looks a hundred times better because in that first yeah. half in particular, when Adafe had those two offsides and the, the third counterattack that on the, the 41st minute where Ter Stegen really saved him, yep. that doesn't happen because Hadafe were targeting Roberto's right side, yep. and they don't target Kunde in the same way. Mm-mm. No, I agree. I mean, I think the, yeah, like you said, I think the absence, yeah, Araujo's absence was huge just because of the knock-on effects it had, you know, brings in Sergio Roberto. Uh, Kunde's not a right back. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the I agree with you. If, if yesterday was a, and I understand to an extent every one of these league games is sort of a quote must win game because you don't want Madrid to narrow the gap. But I mean, if this was, you know, like a final or, you know, whatever, a, a classical or something like that, that's not the lineup that we would have seen. So I don't know if it's instructive to necessarily extrapolate out this lineup over the long term. But at the same time, yeah, I mean, the, the performance wasn't, wasn't stellar. Um, and similarly, I think, you know, Frankie de Young is, in the midfield, if, you know, under, under different circumstances and, you know, Gabi doesn't basically just catch a bit of a rest, you know? So it's, um, and I know I'm always, I feel like, you know, every time we do this, I'm always kind of beating the drum of, Hey, let's not, you know, let's not always freak out about, you know, the, the style points and we're taking three points when we need them. And this is the most important thing. And yesterday is another, I guess, textbook example of that. Uh, but I do agree. I mean, the, the performance was really lackluster. Um, that they came away with three points is great. I mean, it's this is, you know, yet another, 
you know, I guess underwhelming, or if you want to use a, a worse term, but another underwhelming result that we can just happily kind of bury in history and tally the three points and, you know, just go, hopefully go onward and upward. Yeah. I mean, I feel like the concern comes from the fact that for those who listen to the podcast every week, you hear me kind of rinse and repeat this in the Liga, where Barcelona play poorly. I try to convince everybody mm-hmm. that it's all right. You have to get those kind of results to win the Liga. But yeah. Barcelona seemingly keep doing it over and over again. And I think that whole thing about repeating the same process is what I think has people worried and concerned, which is fair. Yeah. But again, I look individually at this match and let's do our little, you know, tactics talk. I don't have a, I need to get some kind of music bed, little tactics <laughs> talk thing that, you know, I don't know what, I don't know how to say it, like tactics talk. And then like a shoo, shoo, like X's yeah. and O's, whatever. <laughs> But not that you could see that. I mean, you could, yeah, you'd hear it, but you wouldn't see it. But anyway, yep. so I think tactically yesterday, again, the lineup itself dictated the way that Barcelona played against Adafe, and I can't mm-hmm. look beyond the 90 minutes that I watched yesterday. Like, for example, right, Ansu Fati, at this point with his confidence and the way things are working, he can't really be the number nine, you know, regardless of whether we can have that debate about him as a nine or him on the wing. He was even moved out to the wing a little bit later. But due to the personnel that were available, the starting lineup you kind of had to go with, you had to go with Dembele and Rafinha and Ansu because the other option was, again, uh, Angel Alakan, who, uh, while I do like that that young player, I don't think this was kind of the moment for him, the way that game was going. And, you know, we'll, we'll do that a little bit later. But as far as what Ansu meant tactically is that even Adafe are wise enough to know that Ansu is the nine in this situation. They only have to track him with one. They don't actually have to track him with that second center back over the top, right? So Lewandowski, uh, and a big part of playing against Adafe in a five at the back is getting those runs of behind in those half spaces. And they were not as available as we saw, especially against Real Madrid. But even against that, in that one, nothing against Atletico Madrid, like the, these weren't there. As well as in the uh, Spanish Super Cup semifinal against Real Betis, these runs of behind weren't there. And the lack of Frankie de Jong is a huge part of that, as well as not having Lewandowski available because again, Lewandowski brings that second, that second center back to help, which does leave some of that half space room for in that in particular, it was Gabi on that left side yesterday to run into. And I think the other huge problem with that and not getting those half space runs is because by having Dembele on the left, which you have to do because you have to have Rafinha on the right. Like there's no option to have Rafinha on the left. We saw it for a little bit. And that basically means <laughs> that change happens because Xavi wants to get something out of Dembele because he felt like he was getting nothing out of either winger. So to get something out of one of them, you move Dembele back to the right. But why Dembele doesn't get much out of the left is because when you pair Balde and Dembele, and actually why I believe that all, that Alba came on for Balde at halftime too, because Balde is so is so comfortable at this point playing wide, getting forward, and dribbling, right? He's, he's so dribbly as is Dembele. So they wind up being a bit dribbly and redundant, and I guess the word would be predictable, on that left side, right? And they're, by both of them wanting to dribble out to the wing, and then Dembele trying to come inward, but he's kind of coming inward in a really, you see, the speed he does in a horizontal way, and he doesn't do it with any pausa at all. It is just 120 miles per hour that Dembele is pushing into the center of the defense, meaning there's no half space, again, available, and there's no time to run from Gabi or even and even Balde. I mean, we saw Balde's limitations yesterday in terms of getting inside and getting that like long shot off that you'd want your outside back. We see it from Alba um, sometimes, but you want to get that outside back in uh, inverting inward. And, but because Balde is also so reliant on his left foot still at this part of his career, he doesn't really have that that right foot that he can trouble in any way, even with a pass. Right, it has to be a cross with his left foot. That so far his numbers are pretty. Pretty fine. But again, the fact that you have Rafinha, who, believe it or not, the only time he got switched over to the left, he delivered a great assist for the goal. And that's how the goal was scored. But other than that assist, Rafinha was pretty lost in this game as well. It just wasn't suiting him. And where De Jong also changes that, I think, is because once you have Pedri kind of playing in that free role, and then you would put Gabi on the right, and you put De Jong on the left, De Jong, because he... It sounds redundant. I mean, not redundant, but it sounds counterproductive or counterintuitive here. But because... De Jong also has the ability to dribble into space as well. Having De Jong, Balde, and Dembele, both, uh, all three kind of dribbling or whatever, but De Jong also has this chaotic, the chaotic element where he can also j- run into the half space. So it's either or, and I think those option out, the optionality of De Jong's positional, I, I said yesterday on the five headlines, it was his positional hurricane that, that is De Jong, 
that it seems like it doesn't work at times, but against a, a team like Adafe, who are playing in those very rigid five, four, one, he does have this ability to get both or not both, but he, Pedri and Gabi, all of them can operate in between the lines. And that extra third player to operate in between the lines is really helpful to find spaces. And that's what you have to do against Adafe, against teams that are in that low block. You've got to find the available spaces. And I think Barcelona wound up being too predictable and too redundant. But again, I, I throw De Jong into that mix. I, la- I add Evan Lewandowski to take one of those center backs away up top. And I think there's a lot more space available. Yes, uh, I'm, uh, I, I was following along. And yes, uh, I am very much inclined to agree. And I do th- too yeah. long to read. Barcelona yeah. didn't have the right personnel. They didn't have right. Right. <laughs> There we go. Too long to read. Well, and I think the, I mean, with Hitafe, you know, the, what was that? I mean, I think now it's maybe three or four years ago or something when they finished in the European places in La Liga. I think they finished, what was it, sixth or seventh? Mm-hmm. But, you know, I mean, they're, if nothing else, even in their, I guess, less than, less than prime seasons during this last handful of years, Hitafe is a, they're a tough out. I mean, they're a, they're a disciplined team and they, you know, they grind out wins and they grind down opposing defenses when it's, when it's working for them. And I, I mean, what I, what I say is like, look at the highlights though from the last, like to your point, look at the highlights yeah. for the last six years. The only yeah. player that you can see in Hadafe highlights, honestly, is Messi for the last like six years. Like Messi beat Hadafe yeah. every yeah. year for the last like, I mean, not, maybe more than that, seven, eight, nine years, whatever. Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm trying to, I'm actually trying to think of anyone else who scored a goal against Hitafe during, you know, since kind of 2017. Mm-hmm. I mean, there might have been a Paulinho in there somewhere or something, but yeah, like it wasn't, it wasn't this free flowing. It wasn't, it wasn't Jogo Bonito, you know, <laughs> like it was just you, Hitafe makes you do this. And I think that this, you know, subpar performance, positive result, which is a drum that, I also am very inclined to to beat and you know the the timing of it is a little suboptimal given the fact that we've kind of been talking about this with Barca particularly in the league for a while now so it's getting a little bit redundant and tiresome but this is you know when when Hatafe is doing what they do this really more often than not is going to be the the recipe for beating them like you're not gonna you're not gonna kind of boat race them, you know. I mean, it's it's rare to see a you know four nil uh, victory over over Hitafe, even by a superior team. I mean, they're just they're they're not they're not set up and they're well they're not set up to get into shootouts and they're they are well drilled at you know kind of diffusing opposing attacks, even high powered ones. And their problem is scoring goals, and mm-hmm. he says not a clean sheet for Barcelona. And I think, again, the other fair argument that people make as to what made that performance so disappointing is that at home, Hidafe starts slinging mud at you and the ref isn't calling fouls. There were fouls on Pedri, Gabi, Roberto, Rafinha, all mm-hmm. went unpunished. No yellows there. Yep. And, and it could have been a red even on Dembele there in the yep. second half. And then, then what, who would have Xavi started in the, the next game against Girona? Who knows? But, yeah. either, but either way, Dembele uh, was able to avoid that. But yeah, I mean, this Adafe side is battling relegation and you would want more from that. You would want Barcelona to say, hey, this is a relegation side. We're not going to let them sling mud at us at our own house. We're going to take care of business. But again, they, they didn't do that. And this Adafe side too, with Mayoral and Elena and, and Mia and Unyal, like they have some players of note, but yet, yeah. the, but yet the, the theme, the personality of Hadafe is still Damien Suarez and um, mm. and um, DNA. Like it's still the same Hadafe that we know. Uh, whether it was, uh, I mean, now that it's Sanchez Flores who's come in, who is yep. usually uh, for a uh, usually managing a side that is fighting against relegation. So it, it's been it's been a few seasons now um, since Bordelas. Since Bordelas was like, hey, we're going to defend and we're defend. That's who we are. We're going to be the the snappiest snappy turtle team in the Liga. So it has been a few seasons on there since Sanchez Flores has taken over and now is trying to get Hadafe back out of the relegation spots. But, you know, I think that's the frustration that this is one of those teams that you should be able to cream in the Liga. And they have been at this point uh, sometimes in the Liga. They have been creamed. And if not, yeah. and I think the worst case scenario that you say is, and it's a compliment to Ter Stegen, that if not for Mark and Ter Stegen, this game doesn't end that way. Like he saved yeah. Barcelona on a number of occasions in a way that the Hadafe goalkeeper did not have to do uh, any other way. And I, I think I was apologetic to Ansu in the middle, 
But again, Ansu didn't do what he was supposed to do. His touch, he, even if he didn't score a goal, his touch was pretty poor yesterday, which is yeah. unfortunate. Again, Rafinha was also still pretty ineffective other than the assist, which again was a perfect dime of an assist. And I, I think I do want to give some compliments as well to the way that that, that back line was set up too, because Christensen, even though he came out of halftime with the hamstring knock, he was really good in that game, anticipating, mm-hmm. stepping up. He, his turnover was the one, or him forcing the turnover was the one that scored the goal because he immediately yeah. put Rafinha clear, and Pedri was able to make that run. Uh, and again, Pedri's only able to make that run because Lewandowski wasn't there. It was Ansu yeah. actually pulling the Hadafe defender pretty deep when, when Ansu Fati was pressing. So again, just like Atletico Madrid, Ansu was working hard again, and yeah. Ansu's movement and space creation, as limited as it seemed to be, also helped create that goal. Um, but Barcelona too, by against his five at the back, was also playing a high line again. That didn't work unless Christensen and Kunde got it right, and they did get it right, and yeah. Ter Stegen did get it right, and so Barcelona did get another clean sheet. And that's another thing where this, the, the numbers tell you well, that's not what I watched. But what you did watch is that Adafi didn't score. Like they could have, but they didn't because yeah. Ter Stegen is in elite form, in the prime form of his career, and even though Araujo was rested, you still have Araujo, you still have Kunde, and you still have Christensen. Yep. And that they were good enough. And so now Barcelona has still only conceded three non El Clasico goals in the Liga, six total in the whole league. And I mean, they're, they're it's historic. Like it, they're on, yep. I'm not kidding. Like looking at the goals per goals against per game average, they are, they are fighting with AC Milan of the early nineties at this point in the season. Like that is how good it is. This is historically good defense as far as like domestic conceding of goals like champions league be damned it's domestic yeah. unbelievable like numerically i mean they're barely yeah i mean they're barely conceding i mean even counting on classic but they're barely conceding you know a third of a goal a game you know take out a classical and you know it's what three and 16 games yep. so yeah you're and the good thing is when you're when you're defending like that and i mean obviously it's not even just when you're defending like that but when you have mark andre testig and just at you know just in his really at the peak of his powers, I think. And that, that helps. I mean, that goes a very long way. And I know, you know, there's an argument to be made that, you know, Hitafe had a couple of, you know, golden opportunities to score. And, but I mean, that's where it kind of comes in. It's, you know, that's why you have a great goalkeeper too. Like that guy counts also when, when other stuff breaks down, he's there to ideally clean up the messes. And, I mean, the, the one thing that it's done, I mean, the, the performances you would hope do find a bit more rhythm and, you know, the the team finds a you know a little bit more of its stride and just in attack and in controlling games. But the for, for this sort of relative dip in form, if not results, to coincide with, you know, just such an incredible defensive record, it's given them a massive margin for error. And, you know, you don't want to take that for granted. And, you know, maybe it won't always be that way. But, yeah, I mean, what they're doing right now is absolutely remarkable. And, yeah, sometimes it's absolutely necessary, too. Well, I'd also say, too, about, like, surviving and holding on in that second half, where mm-hmm. some of the changes that were made with Kessier coming on for Rafinha in the 62nd minute, then going to kind of a midfield setup there with Pedri almost as a false, false nine, with Ansu then moving over to the left and Belay on the right. And uh, Barcelona kind of, again, mirroring for the rest of that game, this 3-2-5 formation for Barca as far as dealing with the 5-4-1 of Adafe. As Adafe was trying to put more and more numbers coming forward, he also, again, I said Alba for Balde at halftime. We mentioned that, and then Eric Garcia comes up for Christensen, which did bring up the worrisome sight of, as I mentioned, many and you and I have talked about last year, when Busquets and Eric Garcia are together, my fear is that Barcelona's defensive setup is moving too slowly laterally where Eric Garcia and Busquets individually make a lot of sense and can play, you know, and, and can play a role, but together I do can, I do get concerned. And then you put on Marcus Alonso for Roberto for the final 15 minutes. And I mean, again, that's like, and I say beggars can't be choosers, but I mean, I don't know if that improves or worsens who knows where Alonso and Roberto stand as far as what they can do defensively. But well, I thought what Xavi did was interesting and I do, and I did, credit him in the five headlines. I want to credit him again here that by pushing Kunde out to the right, it seems counterintuitive once again, because it's like, Oh, you put Kunde, you're at that point because Christensen was out your best defender on the field right now. You put him out on the wing. That seems stupid, right? He should be able to put out fires in the middle. But what that did is that had Kunde staying rather narrow 
inwards towards Garcia and Alonso, basically as a three at the back. And what that did was that helped with defensive transitions. And when you do that, it puts a lot of responsibility on Pedri and Busquets to retain the ball, of which Pedri kind of struggled with. But in the same regard, in the 81st minute, I even marked it down that Pedri winds up getting out of a double team on the sideline. And if Hadafe turned Barca over in that moment, they're in a lot of trouble. And Busquets had the same thing, I think, in somewhere in the 70th minute as Hadafa were kind of taking control of the game. They really had their best stretch for like 12 or 13 minutes from like the 70th to like the 83rd or whatever it was. But Busquets was kind of just steady throughout, right? And I think we can wax poetic a little bit now about Busquets, who was in the beginning of the game, not beginning of the game, but before the game, was honored with that 700 jersey. And I think it's like, it's almost unfathomable to consider. I mean, we could do it. We did it for Messi and we did it for Xavi, but third all time, 700 is a lot of games, like a lot, a lot, a lot of games. And you could see yesterday against Adafi, he was a man of the match. And I think that was a little bit symbolic, but you could see what Busquets continues to offer uh, FC Barcelona as they're this season looking to win the league a title by suffering. Like that is the way that they're going to win the title. And that's by suffering. And it seems like we had all decided that Busquets, you know, he can't really help Barcelona suffer anymore. He's too slow laterally. But yet you look at yesterday, it's Alonso, it's Garcia, it's Busquets, and still it ends one nothing because Barcelona have found ways to suffer in ways that I think, Emil, they have not been able to do for the last five seasons. Well, I think that's, yeah, that's <clears throat> sort of the big thing as well is that my, another kind of counter to the uh, complaints that might arise about the quality of performance, you know, if not the result, is that, you know, I, I absolutely understand the people who want to see, you know, a, a more beautiful performance and a more, uh, you know, a more flowing and a more controlled performance. But yeah, I mean, we're, this is still a, a club and a team trying to fight its way out of, I mean, by, by Barcelona standards, fight its way out of the wilderness. Mm-hmm. And, you know, as you, exactly as you just said, these were performances that went the wrong way in recent seasons. Well, I'm uh, going to correct myself to say th- three years because, I mean, Ernesto Valverde won the Ligas back-to-back yeah. by suffering. So I, I want to, yeah, let yeah. me correct myself and put some respect on Valverde's name uh, yeah. there. I, I'm going to say three seasons. Look, I am, and yeah, I mean, I know, you know, probably won't earn me a, a lot of friends in, in Barca land, but I absolutely, I to this day, I'm like, you know, there, there was some suffering under Valverde, but, you know, there, and I understand it was, you know, Messi and Neymar and everyone doing their stuff, but like, I feel like Ernesto Valverde has uh, just been been redeemed in absentia because, you know, as soon as he left, it was, you know, you didn't like the suffering for league titles. So now let's go ahead and suffer for, you know, not league titles mm-hmm. because it was, yeah. And, but I mean, yeah, particularly the last couple of seasons, though, it was, this is a game that ends one all, I feel like last season or the season yeah. before. And so now we're not only upset about the quality of performance, we're lamenting two points lost and, you know, Madrid's back on our heels and, you know, the, the sky begins to fall again. Whereas now at least you, you can at least lean on the results. You know, I mean, it's, um, it's, it's unnatural for Barca fans to, to slave to the result, but this is what we have right now. And, you know, we need to bring this thing home. <laughs> and so that's, this is this is fine for what it is right now. Yeah, I mean, even yesterday, I, I think while Pedri, it wasn't his cleanest game, you know, as 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 Pedri goes, as, I would love to say Busquets, but really as Pedri goes, Barcelona goes. And again, yesterday, Pedri scoring in consecutive games now for the first time in his career. He winds up equaling five goals on the season, which is what he had last season. So it does give you some hope that, hey, maybe Pedri's going to hit like eight goals this season. And that would, you know, he he said it himself. Pedri said, "I need to score more." You saw it in the Amazon. He's documentary. on pace for double figures. Well, almost, yeah. I mean, well, I, yeah, I guess so. Yeah, if he's off five yeah, now. Seven, yeah, we're only seventeen in. Yes, seventeen in. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, he's on pace for double figures. He has four in the league. He had one in the Spanish Super Cup, and it does give a little bit of hope that he's kind of figuring that part of his game out. And it's something that again, they it seems to be the only thing that Xavi said. You got to work on this. You got to improve on this. And so if he continues to score goals at even that clip where he just helps helps in with a goal and an important goal that wins a game, which is now the second one he's done. Um, you know, that, that's a bright side. 
Uh, and then I would also say on the, the Pedri point too, on, and as bad as that performance was yesterday, I think over the last month, based since the World Cup came back, I think Pedri and Gabi have been uh, have have had a certain level of excellence where I don't think there's been a single game where I didn't think both of them had an in- impact, which was really important where it did feel like even in the fall, like if you have Pedri playing at his best and Gabi's kind of taking a back seat, and if Gabi finally has a breakout, then Pedri's kind of taking a back seat. But I felt like so far in the last month that both of them have just been consistently excellent. And I thought Gabi yesterday too, like it wasn't his best game, right? It wasn't the, the final in the Spanish Super Cup, but he was fine. Like he was, he was, he was a net positive in that context as well. Um, so just putting a, a bow on that, I think we've done enough Adafe here. Should we move mm-hmm. on, Emil? Let's do it. I was actually just going to say, I think I saw a stat, and uh, excuse me if I'm wrong, but I, and I saw an interesting stat that says that, uh, you know, going to the whole, like, Pedri should shoot more, and we might as well just ride the hot hand. Apparently his last three shots on target have all been goals, and so he just needs to just, I mean, yeah. keep shooting. Like, let's, you know, let's, if, let's pretend we're at a craps table, you know, let's just, let's see how long, just keep putting the thing on the target, because, and, you know, I think to your point about Gabi as well, uh, Funnily enough, I mean, I think the at this point the the return match against uh, Espanol, I've don't really remember it much, but um, so post you know in calendar twenty three, I think the quote unquote worst performance between Pedri and Gabi, I think was Gabi in the first in the semifinal of the Spanish Super Cup mm-hmm. against Real Betis, and yeah, you know he he was by his standards, not great. That's fine. If that's the worst that you're going to get out of those two, I mean, you're in spectacular shape. Well, it's interesting too. I know people in the comments are going to be mentioning, we didn't really talk about Ansu. We didn't really go in about, you know, the the voices are getting louder and louder about uh, Ansu's future at the club and Mm -hmm. not having confidence and et cetera, et cetera. But another little Ansu stat that the reason I pushed this Mm -hmm. conversation down the road for another day, for another week, for another month, is because this is the second time in the Liga that Ansu Fati has played the full 90 minutes. The only yeah. other time in the Liga he ever played 90 minutes was against Osasuna. So when we say that even though Ansu is 20 years old, he's been around for four years, it feels like he's been around for a lifetime. Way longer, Antu yeah. Ansu is still just 20 years old, has missed <laughs> over half of his football, and is not even still barely playing 90 minutes. And the only reason he played 90 minutes yesterday was because of Lewandowski's injury. Yeah, he basically I, had sorry, to. Lewandowski and Ferran Torres being suspended. Yep. Uh, and then Rafinha not working. <laughs> like, basically, yeah. that was legit. But he had to play, at, quote unquote, out of position instead of being on the left wing. So, all right. That was, so I'm going to, I'm going to, yeah, move on from the Ansu stuff. <laughs> we'll talk about it another day. But we have, unfortunately, you hear me stuttering here, move on to the bad. And that is with uh, the Danny Alves story. But yeah. we're going to do this through the lens of Xavi's comments and the Barcelona mm-hmm. side of this. Um, because, you know, it is hard to ignore the big picture of the Danny Alves story. If you've been under a rock for the last, what, two weeks now, or mm-hmm. what, three weeks now, former Barcelona star Danny Alves was detained by police in Spain on allegations of sexual assault. The incident apparently happened in a nightclub on the 31st of December, so right for the mm-hmm. new year. He was taken into custody last Friday um, after answering a police summons, and then he appeared before a judge who ordered him to be reprimanded without bail. Yeah. The, he will remain in custody until there was a trial, of which a date has not yet been set. Um, and he, while he did speak that, obviously, he, he pleaded innocence and mm. uh, he made a few statements on the night, that story has since been corroborated as um, incorrect. He has now changed on the record his story three different times. So, uh, and there's also, there's DNA stuff. There's, let's put it this way, the news and the, the stuff and the information they have, um, is is not very uh it's it's not looking good for his it is his pleas of innocence let's put it that way between yes. his, his story and what they have on record and the evidence they have things aren't looking good for danny alves um now through the barcelona perspective of this xavi made a statement he had said uh last week that it's or sorry earlier this week it's difficult to comment on a situation like this. I'm surprised and shocked. I'm in a state of shock. Justice will rule wherever it is. We can't go in. I feel very bad for him. I'm shocked, Xavi said. And then 24 hours after that, so that was Saturday, and then mm-hmm. Sunday after the Hidafe match, he clarifies because obviously there was just a firestorm by the fact that it sounded like he was defending Alves uh, mm-hmm. and not the victim. So then 
clarifies yesterday. I would like to clarify what I said yesterday about Alves. I was misunderstood and wasn't forceful. And I think it's important that I explain myself. It's a very sensitive and important issue. We have to condemn all these acts. Whoever does it, I apologize to the victim and to the victims of sexual violence. I'm surprised that Danny could have done any of these things. I understand the criticism and I apologize. So Xavi does kind of walk it back quite a bit. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, I understand too. I think people will say hey, until he is guilty, he is not guilty. So why are we removing him from the history books? Why are we scrubbing his place? Because on the field, he was. You can't, I mean, you have to say it. Like he's this um, huge personality in the game who was arguably, I mean, I've said it before, probably the greatest right back in, in football in history. If not, you know, maybe Roberto, yeah. uh, maybe Cafu, maybe Roberto Carlos, somebody. Yeah. But, you know, he's one of the greatest right backs uh, or fullbacks of all time mm -hmm. in the game. So he has to be guilty before we completely destroy his character. I will say that, but, uh, you know, my policy has always been here. A, you kind of start by believing the victims. Yes. You also give the you give the person who's accused, you give the accused a chance to um, to to not be guilty. Yeah, there's and yeah, there's due process. Up, there's there's the legal process. If he winds up that he's not guilty, um, you know, this is still going to be a black stain that he got himself into uh, this kind of situation. But again, yeah. the evidence here is pretty overwhelming. Just, again, if you read the case and you if you want to understand um, that a lot of this evidence is stacked against him, that makes this a lot easier to say. I, I think it's 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 time to already begin. Um, reviewing Danny Alves' legacy and how you speak about him and his reputation. Um, yes. So I, I don't know. So, I, I think this is this is a pretty set in stone one. It's not one that's like up for debate at this yeah. point. But again, we have to wait for him to be guilty before we really like cast and throw his name out. But in the meantime, just like Shabby, so, we're going to believe the victim until this goes to trial. Oh, uh, th th that's the thing. Absolutely. And And the thing is, there doesn't seem to be a lot of ambiguity in the kind of the the evidence and uh, not even ambiguity i guess there, there's there doesn't seem to be a lot of contradiction between the victim's account of of what happened and whatever evidence has come to light at this point mm -hmm. so i mean if you know the 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 possibility i suppose exists that you know whatever danny always didn't do this but it certainly doesn't appear to be the case now. And yeah, I mean, for me, it's, um, I mean, in September in the blizzard, I actually, you know, ahead of the world cup, I actually wrote a 5,000 word. I mean, essentially in a, in a sense, it was a weird, like kind of fan ficky, almost like ode to Danny Alves. And just, you know, he basically was my favorite non messy player, you know, non Messi, non Ronaldinho, I guess, player. And just everything about him just screamed kind of, you know, great teammate, great guy, like just, you know, infuses everything with just kind of this like joy and whatever. And every bit of that now is just, you know, the yeah, the the matches happen. Yeah, he probably is the greatest right back to to ever play. You know what I mean? But it's just it's so difficult to to look back on a lot of that with, you know, the, the joy that you felt when it happened. And yeah. And I mean, to, as far as like Chavi's comments go, I mean, I, look, I understand too. He's in the moment, like I understand that he's probably just shocked and, you know, I mean, this is a guy that you shared a locker room with and were presumably very close with and had, you know, these great triumphs with, um, yeah, you know, I mean, it doesn't I, I appreciate Chavi's, you know, um, walking back of his comments and, you know, clarifying and, you know, just correcting his position, he, kind of taking the, the proper stance. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the whole thing, I mean, obviously, just the, the for the victim, more than anyone else. I mean, just, you know, whatever, there's the the whole thing absolutely sucks you know i mean just from from every from every which way but i mean just by from everything that you can see i mean it just it really sucks and it sounds like it's just like a horrific thing that he yeah. did if yep you know if everything think, that we're seeing is you know yeah is born yeah i'm not I know it's defending shabby too i think when he made those initial comments again he he wants his friend to be innocent i mean i think exactly. that's what anybody around him wants to and I think for those, again, responding to this, like 
there is a bit of hypocrisy too because it's like where do you draw the line on, on certain players and certain people and um as far as their actions and how you how we view them like i had said before in the past like when it comes to neymar and rivaldo and danny alves and ronaldinho like their support of Bolsonaro made me uncomfortable, right? Like Maradona, I mean, Maradona has so many documentaries made of him and he's such an intriguing figure because you could argue that for the greatness and glory that he was on the field, which is like one of the top three players of all time, it's Pele, it's Messi, and it's Maradona. Like that's what we talk about, that he had just this, I mean, he, he, he made a lot of people's lives a lot worse. Like he tried to make a lot of people's lives a lot better too. And he did it on the field. Like, and so it, it's just, we seem to always be trying to do this equation for every player um, off the field, right? This more arguments. A similar thing about PK, right? The PK Shakira stuff and the Kings League. Like, I, you could argue that the Shakira PK stuff is kind of giving attention to the Kings League, right? And like kind of helping it get off its feet because it's getting such a amount of press. Because everyone's like, what's PK up to? That's the yeah. guy that Shakira made the song about. <laughs> like, for those oh, who, yeah. don't, who don't know, right? Who don't know about who, who Jared PK is. Because again, people here in my life in the US, like, they know who Shakira is. They don't really know who Jared PK is. Like, they, have an idea yeah. but, right that's just that's Shakira's husband and Shakira winds up being what the number one the first female artist on Spotify to, to be number one in a month the same week that she makes that diss track so yeah. I mean and so for me like yeah like I'm very I'm very anti-cheating like I'm very yeah. anti-cheating on Shakira in particular <laughs> and so, <Right. laughs> and so it's like where do I draw the line on Gerard Piquet and it's like well I guess in certain societies like you know not only is she cheating not forgivable, but it seems to be something that, at least in the world that we live in, you know, well, I, at least I'll, I'll speak in the U.S. and mm. you're from the same place. And it's like, it's one of those things where I go, I don't like that. It puts a bad taste in my mouth, but mm. it's like something that's like just part of our culture. It's something that like cheating happens. I know people have been cheated on. Yeah, that, you're cheating. Yeah. And, it's like, and it's like, ugh, I got to be, you got to almost be forgivable to those kind of people and go, well, they deserve what they get in the nature of that relationship. But it's yeah. like, I'm, I can't completely defame this, this Barca legend in PK because again, his punishment is that he's now divorced. He doesn't like, he's going to have an issue with kids. Like his reputation yeah. is, is, has been slighted. And it's like, that's going to be basically punishment. immortalized three times in, you know, these you know, massive chart topping songs yeah. by his ex. Just oh. like he's getting rinsed. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, yeah, I guess, exactly. you know, but he's he's getting speed bagged. <laughs> so I yeah. guess there's that. But, and then going back to well, the, I mean, the, and I think the, the well then going back to the Bolsonaro support, it's like I can't flame or I can't destroy the reputation of a footballer for their political leanings, even if I disagree with it. But again, right. the minute they're in front of a judge, the minute mm -hmm. that there's jail time, the minute those questions mm -hmm. Uh, then you start to wonder, but then even then that that argument goes out the window when we think about Ronaldinho being jailed for the Paraguay thing. But then yeah, you think, the, what were the charges? Right, the charges were about a passport and yeah. Ronaldinho just being Ronaldinho, basically. Like he gets yeah. jailed because he's just this figure that's like everyone knows me. I'm Ronaldinho, and like and then yeah. that hubris is what gets him in jail. Which again, even yeah. though we're now we're talking about the law, that's different than what Danny Alves is in. So it's like I just want to let people know, like well, it is. I know it's complicated and hypocritical, but it's it's all different. Well, and I think with the like you mentioned with a lot of the Brazilian footballers and the and the Bolsonaro support and everything, um, look, I mean, I was and you know it's light years different from what Dani Alves has seemingly done, but you know it, even just in my own personal ledger, I was trying to figure out what to do with my uh, enduring feelings for Javi when he was you know, the mouthpiece for the Qatari government for, you know, half a decade after leaving Barca, you know, like, again, it's not illegal. I understand it was his payday and part of his job was to do this, but you know, it was, it was, it was pretty grimy stuff. Every time, every time I'd have to read a block quote about Chavi talking about what a great bastion of diversity it is and what a wonderful place it is and everything, it just made my skin crawl. And I was just, you know, Oh, just wait, just wait till you hear Messi and his connection to the Saudi Arabian World Cup bid. Just everybody oh. hold your horses. It's got Oh, I, yeah. I mean, that's yeah. look, my 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 one my one hope is that Messi just continues to at least not speak. But like, you know, just the the photos are going to be just, yep. you know, cringe enough. I'm just I'm yep. hoping he doesn't start piping up, too. But um yeah, but so I mean, I guess like yeah, we have those. But it, again, like the the Alves thing is in a because we are now dealing with literally a legal issue and a legal issue that was, you know, a focused kind of targeted violence against another person and another person that you know presumably 
in doing something like that, it's you're you're targeting this this violence and this this atrocity on someone who you're presuming doesn't have the same power as you and doesn't have the power to hold you to account for this, or at the very least, the the societal mechanisms that have made you, you know, this beloved figure will bail you out or yep. silence her or whatever it is. Yep. Yep. So I, I think that we can put the Danny Alves thing um, away for now. So I'm going to actually, the next one is actually the, the final topic of the show real yeah. quick is the good, but I'm going to start it with the bad part of the story yeah. and then we'll transition to the good part. So the bad part is that while the Barca Femini did win the Spanish Super Cup, 3-0 mm -hmm. over Real Sociedad, uh, another huge final for Aitana Banmati. We'll talk about that. Um, the bad was that after after Rubiales was in Saudi Arabia delivering the, the medals on this huge stage for the Men's Spanish Super yeah. Cup uh, and all that stuff, if you didn't see this, the Femini had to pick their own medals up out of the, the cases like that they box, came in yeah. and put them around their own necks. And what a bad job by the Federation. Like, awful job by the Federation. Like, you are embarrassing. Um, yeah. And do not ever, 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 ever speak support of women's football if you're going to not even take the time. I, I, apparently, there were reports that they were there. Some representatives were there. But they remained in their box. Then like, where the hell were they? Yeah, yeah just Come down I mean, to the field and hand out the medals. You, uh, Oh, uh, my God. I mean, it's just ridiculous. It's, it's unfathomable. I mean, it just because it's one thing to not be there. It's one thing to just say, "Oh, I was busy because I was doing whatever." Because again, a million people, especially even yeah. those who listen to the show, are going to come to their aid and say, "Hey, would they rather go to?" I mean, is it more important to go to a first team, um, you know, first division match? You know, whether it's Atletico, Athletic Club against Real uh, Real Madrid, like okay, the representatives were there because they have to be at a first team match or whatever, instead of being the Spanish Super Cup. Fine. Well, that was even the day before, by the way. Yeah. But like, whatever, whatever. But to be there and not be a part of it and yeah. not like create an event out of it is if you made the trip there, that just like breaks my brain logically. To not at least to be there and not at least just go stand by that table, like the sad little table with the box on it. And at yeah. least like find some middle manager or something who, you know, just would you it would make their month to be on camera or just you know yeah. get a moment's shine send send that person down there have them stand by the sad table with the box and at least hand out the medals i mean just the whole thing was just so gross you know yeah get a better table i mean get a like oh get my a god yeah it was it wasn't even a good picnic table yeah i mean it was yeah. just the whole thing was sad well fortunately though again the barca femini they win a trophy that had not say kind of eluded them but They've now won the Super Cup in three of the last four years since it was created in 2020 for the, for the women's side. With Atletico Madrid, the only team that stopped them, they, they lost in penalties in the semifinal in 2021. Then they wound up winning it uh, last year in 2022. I think that's a correction from the five headlines I had. But that also brings their unbeaten run in domestic competitions to 58 games, which yeah. is a pretty <laughs> incredible number. Um, and they did, did all of this, by the way, as much as I was apologetic for the the men's first team against Adafe and all the omissions, mm -hmm. well, they did this without Alexi Buteas and Caroline Graham Hansen, arguably yeah. their two most talented players. But as she is doing, and I, I think I really like this beginning to be her reputation here, that Banmati keeps stepping up in yeah. these finals and keeps stepping up in these moments when they need her to. She is actually injury wise, and as yeah. as far as like her ceiling, Banmati hasn't had the best season, right? I don't think yeah. she is pushed herself into a Ballon d'Or conversation, honestly. Like, yeah. the, the year they won the treble, it was a much better season for her. But this final, she opens up the scoring in the 13th minute, then adds a second in the 47th right after halftime because credit to Real Sociedad, they took it to halftime mm -hmm. at just one nothing. But between Banmati and um, and Gaisa, it was it was just too much for them. And then third goal happens uh, and then with uh, Ashwala in, mm -hmm. what was it, 96 minute or something? something like, yeah. Gets, mm -hmm. gets the final goal. Um, so Barcelona capping off Again, another trophy for them, which just like the men, where that trophy kind of gets you in the trophy mood, where you yeah, go, okay, cool. that was get the ball one. rolling, yeah, yeah, that was the one that like matters the least. But let's see about the other ones. Well, and I think uh, there, there's an interesting thing. I think with um, with Barca Femme, I mean, you know, the we always talk about their their roster is just so hilariously stacked, and you know, there's not really any weak links or anything. But they're actually the, and I think we talked about all of them at various times. There are the four players I think who both from a just 
from a raw talent and just like an innate kind of sense of how to dominate and be great sense. Uh, you know, it's obviously Alexia, it's Carolyn Graham Hansen and sort of the falling in with them in that kind of stone cold killer category. I think I put Claudia Pina and Aitana yeah. and, you know, just in terms of Aitana for me, and you know, it's funny here because, you know, she's, she's caught a line. She wears number 14, you know, as an homage to Johan Cruyff and she wrote a book a, you know, a book that she wrote came out this past year. It has 14 chapters, you know, like she is very much sort of that, like, and it's, you know, in, in a weird way, I mean, not that, um, and I'm not saying that she's, you know, kind of, you know, chasing the spotlight or anything like that, but she seems much more eager to sort of be the face of women's football in Catalonia, almost even more than Alexia does. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, but when you watch her play, I mean, she is probably as, kind of vicious a competitor as as you'll see and her just technically she is as unbelievably gifted as anyone on that team and you know it's been good to see her come back from injury and and I do love that she's getting these chances to you know put her stamp on significant games um not that she ever gets lost I mean she finished fifth in the Ballon d'Or voting you know for 22 right. so I mean she's she's hardly you know overlooked, but, um, but it's nice to kind of see her get healthy and just have a chance to kind of show her, show her stripes as another just undeniable, you know, super duper star. And yeah, I mean, she's, she's absolutely fantastic. Yeah. And I think what that final did for me was I'm excited at the idea of Alexia and Graham Hansen mm -hmm. and the hope for the feminine is that everybody is healthy because I think what they deserve as yeah. to what they build in a domestic campaign is to have everybody healthy and be able to compete. Um, mm -hmm. But as I keep kind of bringing up with the women's game, Champions League is anybody's guess this year because of the sheer number of superstars that have been on the shelf. So we'll have to yeah. see. But again, Barcelona taking care of business. On February 10th, they do the draw and they're either going to wind up with Roma, PSG, or Lyon. Yeah, I mean, which is a, kind of a ridiculous because all three of those teams finished second in their yeah in their respective groups. Yeah, I mean, not to say that I, I'd want to avoid uh, Lyon just yet, but uh, Lyon is not Lyon this year. PSG yeah. is a bit more Lyon, if if you know what I'm saying. Yeah, but, uh, but give me Roma for that one, and let, let's figure out the other stuff exactly. in yeah. matches down the road. But uh, anyway, we will see you again on probably Thursday. Uh, because we've got the uh, Real Sociedad, Barcelona, mm. uh, Copa del Rey midweek. But yeah, in the meantime, give me a follow on Twitter. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at the Barcelona Pod, at the Barcelona Podcast on TikTok, which is popping off right now, and then close Facebook group and the Discord, uh, two different places where our community is growing, and then Patreon, and obviously YouTube, a lot of content over there. Most importantly, though, thanks so much for listening to the Barcelona Podcast. Until next time, we'll talk to you soon. And Forza Barca. Forza Barca.